Yeah, thank you, Carolyn. And thank you everybody for coming out on this snowy day. I guess staying in on this snowy day and watching us. So one of the wonderful things about Zoom is that the weather just doesn't matter, um, which is kind of, kind of terrific. I thought what I'd do is talk a little about the inspiration and the research behind the lines of Fifth Avenue. And I'll, I'll show some slides of some of my research as well. And then we can open it up to questions about the book, about any of the books, about the writing process, really, um, whatever, whatever strikes you. So I write books that are set in landmark New York City buildings. So it might be the Barbizon Hotel for Women, the Dakota, Grand Central Terminal. And, you know, there's so many that I joke around that by the 30th book, I'll be doing the gas station on the corner of 11th Avenue, but I will make that work, I promise. Um, and so what happens after, as I'm kind of finishing up each book, I start thinking about where I could set the next book. And the idea for setting a book at the, the New York Public Library, which is where the Lions of Fifth Avenue is set, actually came from my readers. I had been doing author talks around the country for my other books, and people would often come up to me after and say, oh, you know, what about this building? What about that building? And the New York Public Library came up over and over and over to the point where I thought, okay, you know, maybe I'll, I'll take a look and start doing some research. And when I'm doing that, I'm looking for what surprises me. Because if something about a building's history or the people within it surprises me, I know that it will surprise the, the reader. And so, and also, you know, one of the things was that, that libraries are really important to me. When I was growing up, we moved around a lot, as Carolyn mentioned. And the one thing that was a constant in every community was the library. Once a week, my mother would put my brother and me in the car and we'd drive to the, the library and I'd go get books on horses and he'd go get a book on trains. And, you know, it was just the one constant when everything else seemed very, very unconstant. Um, and, and so I started looking into the New York Public Library and I, I really wasn't sure if it would work because it's a library, you know, it's, I normally do buildings where people live. And, and so I thought, okay, but, you know, let's look into it. And um, I'm just gonna share my screen here so that you can kind of see some of the fun things that I did as I was um, doing this. One second. So there's the cover. And believe it or not, this is the site of the New York Public Library in 1879. It was built on the site of this reservoir called the Croton Reservoir, which ser served all the drinking water for New York City in the 1800s. And it had 50 foot high granite walls. It had this promenade that you could walk around, which would be amazing. And that's where it is. So this view is looking down Fifth Avenue with the reservoir on the right. Now we would see, um, of course, the New York Public Library there. And when they built it, they actually incorporated a lot of the granite stones into the library's foundation, which you can see if you um, go inside and look at the South Courtyard, you can see the stones right there. And here is an early shot of it. So this is before it opened. The library opened in 1911. Um, it had 1 million books inside when it opened then. This is 1908, so it's a little bit before. You can see the pedestals for the lions are in front, but there's no lions just yet. I love this shot. When it was built, it was the largest marble building in America. Um, and so it was just this, this amazing, amazing, unique building. It took nine years and $9 million to build. And it was built by these um, architects, Carrere and Hastings. And very sadly, Hastings was killed in a taxi cab accident a, a month or so before it opened. So he never saw it. But what they did is they, they really decided to make this building so that it was a, like an organic whole. And so they not only thought about the exterior, but they also thought about the interior very, very seriously. And, and so they designed everything. This is of course the Rose Reading Room, which is at the very top floor. And I love giving book talks to towns near New York because most people have been inside it. Um, and so you've probably seen it. And it's just a gorgeous um, structure. And they designed not only kind of the, the, the walls and the ceiling, but even the, the desks and the chairs, even down to the waste baskets they decided what should be in there so that it really created this very holistic um, building. 
And here underneath the reading room is the stacks. And this is where all the books are kept, at least most of them. Um, in the 1990s, they dug out underneath Bryant Park, which is right next to the library. And there's two levels of storage underneath there now. But in the old days, it, this is what it looked like. And keep in mind that, that the New York Public Library was not, it, it's not a lending library. You can't take books out. You have to read whatever it is inside the library. And so they designed a system where at the very top floor, you would go to the card catalog and fill out the slip. And the clerk would put the slip into a pneumatic tube, which are still there, you can still see them. And it would go all the way down into the stacks. And then a page would run around and find your book, bring it back and put it on um, kind of this trolley system, like a vertical Ferris wheel, really, where it would come back up and, and would be delivered to you up in the Rose Reading Room. And there was also, of course, a dumb waiter for oversized books. But this is really kind of the hive underneath the library. And the stacks are all made of steel, um, which was because of fireproofing. They wanted to make sure there were, there were no fires. So when I'm doing a story, as I mentioned, I'm looking for surprises. And one of the first things I did is I went on the New York Times. There's something called the Times Machine. And you can see old New York Times papers from the 1800s and do searches. So I did a search for the New York Public Library in 1955. I found this article about the retirement of the library superintendent. And he had worked there for 30 years and it turned out he lived inside the library in a, a four bedroom apartment um, that's kind of on this sneaky mezzanine level. And he lived in the library with his wife and his three children for 30 years. His, wife, his daughter was born in the library um, his son used to raise pigeons on the roof. I, I read that um, they used to play baseball using books as bases until they got caught. There were just so many wonderful, wonderful stories. And the minute I read that, I thought, okay, a family living in the library, perfect. I will, I will work with that. And so what I like to do is do all this research and learn about the facts and then use that as kind of a framework or a scaffold where I layer a fictional plot and characters on top of that. And so here is the real superintendent, Mr. Fiedler. And here is the floor plan of his apartment in the library. So that there's two courtyards, the North and the South one. And so his apartment kind of bordered two sides of the South, court, South Courtyard. And it was on this mezzanine level. So you kind of go in the main floor and you go up a sneaky set of stairs and suddenly you are in this apartment. And the bedrooms were M1, two, three, and four. And then along the bottom of it were all the living spaces, the, the kitchen, the bathroom, that kind of thing. And, and it was beautiful. I was able to get a wonderful behind the scenes tour and they showed me the space. It's now offices and storage, but it's very much intact. So you could still see the doors and you know what the view out the window was like, um, which was kind of wonderful. I, I joked around that they should make it into an Airbnb and because I think people would pay a lot of money to have a night in the, in the superintendent's uh, apartment. Um, and so what I did, I, I took this idea of a family and I created a story and I love going in two timelines. So um, I, I make one timeline, an older one, one a modern one so that I can see how, how people's voices and how the city and how the building has changed over time and kind of bring that to the readers. So I decided to set the lines of Fifth Avenue in 1913 and 1993. And in 1913, it's from the point of view of the superintendent's wife. And she lives in the library with her wife and two kids. And she's surrounded by all this knowledge, but she, she feels stifled. She wants something more out of life. And so she applies to Columbia Journalism School and she gets in and her world is really cracked wide open. And then in 1993, my book is from the point of view of a curator named, named Sadie who works at the Berg Collection, which is um, working with very rare books. And she's about to put on this big exhibit when one of her rare books goes missing. And she's drawn into a series of book thefts that happened 80 years ago, as well as a terrible tragedy that happened to the superintendent's family back then. And I like to say the book is really about the magic of the written word and the power of women's voices. And it was just um, so much fun to work on. And as I mentioned, Sadie works at the Berg Collection. And here you get a, an inside view of it. Um, it's not a place where you can just walk in. It's only open for scholars and researchers. You have to apply 
and show why you want to work in there because everything in there is so rare. It's very, very carefully um, guarded. And the Burr Collection was founded by two brothers, Henry and Albert. You can see their, their portraits down at the end there. And they donated their Burr Book Collection in 1940 to get it started. And these days it has, oh, um, it has archives and manuscripts and um, things that represent the work of more than 400 authors, including original manuscripts and letters by Nabokov, Tennyson, Browning, W.H. Auden, Walt Whitman. And then they also collected all this interesting ephemera, which really kind of made me perk up as a, an author. So they have things like a lock of Walt Whitman's hair. They have Virginia Woolf's walking stick that she left by the side of the river right before she went and drowned herself. They have Charlotte Bronte's writing desk. They have Jack Kerouac's boots. Um, all of these really interesting things. And, and what these do is, for me, they bring these authors to life. They show that you know, they're, they're not just amazing authors, but they were people, they were human. Um, and, and so my character in the story is, is using that to try and make that, drive that point home. So for example, here's a copy of the original manuscript of a poem by Walt Whitman that is in the Bird Collection. They also have, by the way, Virginia, they recently acquired all of Virginia Woolf's diaries, which is amazing. Um, and so here you can see the process of creation, right? You can see where he scratched things out. There's a different color pen. Um, at one point, I think he scratches out something that says final draft and, you know, because he's just completely, he's trying to figure out how to put these words together to create, create a poem. And this is something, of course, that we've lost today is as you do something on a computer program and delete it and um, you don't see this. And so in the Burke collection, you can go in and, and see how it came to be. You know, so you could see this, you could see Virginia Woolf's um, diaries, which were written on these stationer's notebooks in pen. Um, and it reminds us that they're human, that they, they chose words, worked through these drafts. You know, a rip and tear might be a sign of frustration. There might be, you know, a stain from a coffee mug where a, a writer might not have realized that this, this one piece of paper could be worth thousands of dollars one day. And it's just pretty wonderful. And the book theft that I chose for my book is based on one that happened at Butler Library at Columbia University in 1994, where a thief stole $1.8 million of rare books over the course of three months, and no one could figure out how he was getting in and out. And I was lucky enough to interview a librarian who was the head librarian at the time. Her name is Jean Ashton. And we had a couple interviews where she talked about what it was like as these things kept on going missing and how the staff started turning on each other, trying to figure out what was going on um, and, and just the effect it had on, on everybody working in the library. They did finally catch the thief. And as he went to trial, Jean Ashton testified before the judge and she asked for a harsher sentence. At that point, he was only getting, I think, three years. And she explained that, that what he stole was not just X amount of books worth X, but a piece of Western history and culture, and that the loss causes irreparable damage to scholarly research. She, she said that you know, the value of these items fluctuates over time, so you can't go on the value of the day. Something that wasn't worth much 50 years ago, like um, women's diaries or records of slave transactions are today very, very valuable because our way of thinking has evolved over time. So she made this passionate plea and the judge was so moved that he granted the, the thief a harsher sentence. And these days, um, anyone who steals anything from a museum or a library is automatically granted a harsher sentence. And part of that is because of what Jean Ashton did as she testified. Um, and so to me, she's a, a true literary hero. And so some of the key lo locations in the book included the library, um, it included Columbia Journalism School, of course, where my character Laura goes in the 1910s. Um, her experience there was very different from when I went there and got a master's. Um, in 1913, the school had just been opened one year. It was co-ed, but the women had a very different tract from the men. So the women were sent off to cover orphanages uh, while the men were sent off to cover politics and murders. And so in the book, Laura's experience is, is frustrating as she's trying to learn how to be a reporter and and you know learn how to to get out there in the world 
and um, she's dealing with the sexism of the time. And I, I always like to point out that um, the things have definitely changed. When Laura went to Columbia University, the J School, it was 15% women. Today, it's 75% women. So things have, have certainly changed. Another location in the book is Book Row in New York City. And that was a, a there were over a hundred bookstores um, just below Union Square on Fourth Avenue. And that's where you went if you wanted to buy a book, a used book or a, a, a new book. And um, it was there for 90 years. And then books just bookstores started dying away. And now there is only one bookstore left. It's the Strand. It's around the corner on Broadway, but it's doing well and hanging on. And um, you know, luckily independent bookstores have have really kind of um, shot back. And, and you know, thank you again for supporting your, your local library and your local bookstores. We have some wonderful ones around here. And so it's fun to go back in time and see you know, where people would go shopping back then. Other locations include the Club CBGBs and Lincoln Center. I love to try and bring all the locations in New York that I adore into each book because there's so many. I could, you know, it's incredible. Another interesting thing I discovered in my research was the Heterodoxy Club. And this was a club that was founded in 1912 by this woman, Marie Jenny Howe, that's her with her guitar there in her Greenwich Village apartment. And what it was, was a place where women would gather every second Saturday, they would gather in a room above a restaurant on McDougal Street, and they would debate and discuss the issues of the day. And it was only women, and they talked about things like birth control, the right to vote, women's rights, even things like free love, things that we kind of associate with the 60s and 70s, these women were talking about and debating and, and really hashing out um, what it meant to be a woman back then. One of the topics um, included, you know, should a woman keep her maiden name? And if she does, would that tear apart the fabric of society? And these were women who were really forward thinking and ahead of their time. They were considered the new woman. Um, and these were women who were wanted to have more of a a role in life than just mother and child. And I was just surprised at how forward um, Greenwich Village was at that time in terms of very accepting of, of gay relationships and lesbians and, you know, really whatever, whatever happened, happened. And then it wasn't until after the First World War that everything kind of clamped back down and we went back into more traditional thinking. Um, but the, the uh, heterodoxy club, it's called heterodoxy because that's the opposite of orthodoxy. It, it means deviating from society's norms. Um, it attracted icons like Agnes DeMille and, and Charlotte Perkins Gilman and was around for, for about 30 years. And I've had people talk about, oh, we should bring it back. So we'll see, which I think would be great. So that's a little bit about, um, about that. One of the really fun things um, about working on this book was the, the working with the New York Public Library. It turns out they have something called the Allen Room. And that's where writers with a book contract can write their books. And so there I was writing a book about the library in the library. I would get books on typhoid or the construction of the library sent to me right to my bookshelf. And on top of that, the librarians were incredibly helpful where they would answer you know, any question I had, including at one point, in an early draft, um, I had a dead body in the book. It's not there now. But in early draft, I had a dead body. And I reached out to one of the librarians and I said, look, if you had to hide a dead body in the library, where would you put it? And she wrote back right away with the location, oh, down in the basement next to the carpenter's room. And had, I had a floor plan, I was all set to go. Um, and I'm sure we're both under surveillance at this point. And she said she'd never gotten that question before, but. Uh, but she knew, she knew where to put it, which was pretty amazing. And one of the things I did as I worked on this book was go through old Harper's Bazaar, old women's magazines from the, the time. And it was just interesting to see, you know, I'm looking for how things have changed over time and how they haven't. And I remember one issue of the, the magazine had on one side an essay all about the new woman. What should women be doing, you know, outside the home? How do we find financial independence? Um, you know, what about careers? And then the other side of the magazine had a whole article about the, the latest fad diet, which was called the barrel diet. And just so you know, what that entailed was buying a barrel, festooning it with ribbons, and then taking out the bottom and the top and crawling inside and rolling around on the floor until you were sweaty. 
And I just read that and thought, oh, okay, you know, some things just, just never change. Um, and luckily we don't have the, the barrel diet today. But really the book is just my gift to, to book lovers and librarians everywhere. It was such a, a joy to, to work on and, and to write. And it's so much fun to have it out in the world today. And, and yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. 